thank you for joining us for Unite for Sites webinar about making the most of an international experience. We are thrilled to have all of you here with us today. My name is Jennifer Staple Clark, and I'm founder and chief executive officer of Unite for Sites. I will briefly introduce you to Unite for Site and then review the webinar logistics, and then we will hear from our six expert panelists. Unite for Site is a global <coughs> health nonprofit organization that promotes high quality care for all. We offer extensive global health and social entrepreneurship education programs. Our Global Health University program offers a free webinar series, including today's webinar, and we also offer 20 online certificate programs, which range from a, global health, a certificate in global health to a certificate in global health research to a certificate <coughs> in environmental health and many other certificate programs. We have more upcoming webinars during January and beyond as well, including a webinar next week about learning from innovation experts. And in February, we have a webinar coming up called How to Start a Career in Global Health, as well as two webinars about pitches, branding, and marketing strategies during March. And all of those webinar details can be seen on our website at uniteforsight.org slash webinars. Additional educational opportunities for students and professionals includes participation in Unite for Sites annual Global Health and Innovation Conference. And we have our upcoming 13th annual <coughs> conference on April 16th and 17th at Yale University. So definitely save the date and details about that annual conference, which convenes more than 2,000 people from all 50 states and 50 countries, can be seen at uniteforsite.org slash webinar, or I'm sorry, uniteforsite.org slash conference. And the Global Health and Innovation Conference also includes an innovation prize, which includes a $10,000 and $2,000 cash prize for the two best pitch presentations at that Global Health and Innovation Conference in April. And again, additional details and instructions for applying can be seen at <coughs> slash conference. In addition to the webinars, online certificate programs, and annual conference, we also have healthcare delivery programs that provide care to patients living in extreme poverty. And we partner with phenomenal local eye clinics in Ghana, Honduras, and India to provide quality eye care to patients who are otherwise unable to access or afford care. And these programs are locally led and managed by the local medical professionals. <laughs> And our collaboration has provided eye care to more than 2 million people by local doctors during the past decade, including more than 90,000 site restoring surgeries by local ophthalmologists. Unite for Sight is the world's only organization that is a healthcare delivery organization that also offers immersive global health education and social entrepreneurship opportunities for both students and professionals. Participants support and learn from the local doctors in Ghana, Honduras, and India as the doctors provide care to the patients living in poverty. And the local doctors are social entrepreneurs who design incredible, effective, and innovative strategies to eliminate barriers to care for the hardest to reach patients. And now I'll describe for you the basic logistics of this webinar. We're so delighted to have all of you with us today, and we have about 500 people in our audience today. And we also have six incredible panelists who all have a wealth of expertise to share with you during this next hour. Each of the panelists today will start by giving a two-minute introduction about themselves, their current role, and their key piece of guidance regarding making the most of an international experience. And then we will move to the questions and answers. And we received stellar questions already from you, our audience, by Sunday's question submission deadline. And we selected many questions from those already submitted, but those, for those who have additional questions to ask the panelists today, please simply add your question to the small text box on the left of your webinar screen, and we will add those to the queue as well. And we also encourage you to tweet about the webinar, including your key lessons learned by using the hashtag GHUWebinar, and you can see that hashtag in the webinar visuals on your screen. We will proceed now with having each of our panelists introduce themselves. I'm delighted to introduce to you our first panelist, Ned Breslin. Ned, please introduce yourself and share your key guidance regarding making the most of an international experience. Yeah, so hi. Uh, my name is Ned Breslin. I worked in the water and sanitation sector for about 30 years. I spent 20 of those in living in Africa. Uh, South Africa, Zimbabwe, Kenya, and Mozambique. Uh, I returned to the United States in 2006 and took over as the CEO of Water for People. 
Um, and then uh, this year, uh, or last year, I guess, 2015, uh, decided I needed to change, so I shifted to uh, the Wounded Warrior Project, which is a, a nonprofit in the United States focused on post-9/11 vets and their families. Uh, and it's been a truly liberating and fantastic switch, frankly. Um, so I've gone from toilets and taps internationally to people domestically. And so, um, yeah, just keep that in mind uh, while I'm chatting. Uh, I think in terms of overseas work, uh, my uh, advice has always been around um, just being incredibly humble and aware that um, a lot of things happen and a lot of things are going on that uh, we generally don't read uh, well or accurately. Um, and so that humility and that uh, kind of curiosity uh, generally is a good trait to have. Um, and I think that I'll, I'll leave my introduction there, if that's okay. Excellent. Thank you so much, Ned. And Scott Corlew, if you can also please introduce yourself. Scott? Sorry, I was also on mute uh, as I was okay. talking away. Apologies to everyone. Uh, I'm semi-retired, which is a nice way of saying that I've now got the time to research and write and consult on whatever I want, if you will, uh, whatever comes along in the global surgery realm that seems uh, interesting and worthwhile. In terms of background, I'm a plastic surgeon. I, before doing plastic surgery training, I spent a couple of years in the U.S. Public Health Service practicing primary care. I uh, finished general surgery training and practiced that for a couple of years before doing plastic surgery training and then practiced that for a number of years, volunteering, um, I won't say all over the world, but a lot of places internationally. In mid-career, I went and got, in, got a uh, degree in international health and then spent the last several years as chief medical officer for what was then Interplast, now called Resurge International. Uh, that's a plastic surgery organization that used to uh, send all these short-term team trips around the world. Uh, while I was there, we transitioned into more of an educational organization working with surgeons in developing countries, helping them get uh, properly credentialed as well as expand what they can do and then also helping where we could help develop their, develop their work. Uh, so I guess I can leave that at that, leave that there for now. As far as a key lesson learned from all that, just to throw out there, I would say, I would echo, uh, kind of what Ned said, the importance of really understanding the nuances of things in the places where you work. In terms of healthcare, um, the nuances of the healthcare system and of the local way in which healthcare is delivered, um, and what what really is happening and what's needed on the ground. Uh, so I'll leave it at that, and we can go on to who's next. Terrific. Thank you so much, Scott. And Shin Daimi, if you can also please introduce yourself and share your key lesson learned. Sure. Um, first off, Jennifer, thanks for having all of us. It's a really great pleasure to be here again. Uh, my name is Shin Daimyo. Uh, currently, I act as the Senior Advisor for Mental Health uh, to the organization called Partners in Health. I'm also a Paul and Daisy Soros Fellow and currently a Master's of Science in Nursing candidate at the Yale School of Nursing. Uh, I've been working in global health for about the past 10 years now in places all over the world that include uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and Western Africa, uh, Siberia, Central and South America, and Haiti. Um, in various areas unrelated to mental health, um, I worked at the World Health Organization working in health policy, uh, health system strengthening in Lesotho, uh, along with hospital management and supply chain management in Lesotho, uh, and quality improvement work in some of the aforementioned countries. Um, currently, in my role at Partners in Health, I work specifically on two projects intently and then uh, more uh, softly in other places, uh, but specifically in scaling up community-based mental health services um, in extremely rural areas 
in Haiti and Rwanda, working with uh, the public sector and the Ministry of Health to not only build these mental health systems, but also build local capacity so that it's sustainable long term. Um, for me, uh, I definitely echo uh, the themes of humility that, that have already been said, um, but the one thing I would like to add is really to embrace the complexity of the various health, economic, social problems that are oftentimes intertwined in many places that we work and in many of the problems that we end up uh, looking at because a health problem is not always just a disease <laughs> issue, it's also a systems issue, it's always an economic issue. And if you really want to get to the root of that problem, we really have to look at those various areas and be much more open-minded to how complex things can be and not try to simplify them that much. And I'll leave it at that. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And Brian Hoiser, please introduce yourself as well. Hey, thanks so much, Jennifer. I'm thrilled to be back at the United for Sight on another one of these wonderful webinars. I'm Brian Hoiser. I'm on faculty at the Peabody School of Education and Human Development at Vanderbilt University. Uh, I'm also, uh, I have a courtesy appointment at the Institute for Global Health. Uh, and I, as I like to joke, came kicking and screaming into global health. Uh, I originally trained in comparative international education and economic development. And the more I got into the relationship between education and uh, human development, the more I realized that there was a very strong, profound, almost inseparable overlap with all of the health indicators. Uh, and so I've, I've been dabbling in this for six or seven years, uh, mostly uh, from the research angle, trying to understand the nexus, again, between uh, international education or, or comparative international education, global health, <coughs> economic development. Uh, you know, I, I, I am sometimes the cynic at the table, so let me go ahead and assume that role early. Uh, you know, my first piece of advice, uh, and students come to me dozens of times a year, they sit in my office, undergrads, master students, and they say, you know, uh, tell me how I can make it abroad. How do I, you know, how do I go abroad? And I always ask them the same thing. They say, uh, tell me about your tools. Tell me about your capabilities. Uh, tell me what languages you can speak, what you can teach, what you can measure, what you can build, and what you can heal, right? And if you don't have any of those capabilities, I actually think you need to ask a very serious question about whether or not you should be going abroad to do international work. Everyone in this call knows that uh, the distance between um, uh, global health and, and public health has, has shrunk. The global is local, local is global. There are lots of opportunities uh, to develop skills domestically. And I'm increasingly concerned with um, the, the new popularity of global health endeavors and how it's kind of sexy to go abroad and do international work. Uh, and so I would, I would, my first suggestion is have a real honest conversation with yourself about whether or not it's necessary to do the work that you want to do abroad. Um, and I'll talk more about the ethics of, of all the rest of it later. Terrific. Thank you so much, Brian. And Marie, if you can also please introduce yourself. Sure. Thanks again, Jennifer. I'll echo everyone else. It's always wonderful to be on these webinars. So my name is Marie Martin. I'm the Assistant Director of Education and Training at the Vanderbilt Institute for Global Health, and I also co-direct the Global Health Track here for our Master of Public Health. I have an academic background in international education and policy and have been developing curriculum and academic programs for about 15 years, both in the U.S. and abroad. And my work actually began in the Czech Republic working with the European Union, developing training programs for civil society enhancement. But I've moved more squarely into global health, much like Brian, recognizing the intersection between education, health, and in, in my context, policy. So I work in particular to build human capacity to improve health outcomes in low resource settings. And I do that at three distinct levels, working with students here at Vanderbilt and elsewhere to be more effective practitioners, to have the toolkits that are essential for being effective partners and community. At an institutional level here at Vanderbilt and elsewhere to build high level training programs in global health and working with our low and middle income. The host has partners. joined the conference. Uh, partnering to build capacity on the ground so that uh, individuals can effectively tackle their own health issues. 
So my advice, um, I laugh at Brian's because one of my pieces of advice was cynical in nature as well, uh, but, but I will say this because it's, um, I think it, it, it um, builds off that. Try not to let your international experience be something that simply enhances your resume or at worst adds to your social media presence. I think it's one of the things that we're conflicted <laughs> with it in academia. Um, and the importance of reflecting and thinking critically about your experience, imagining how you can leverage that learning into future endeavors, be they international or domestic. Thinking about connecting the dots to be as effective as you can be in impacting social positive change. Excellent. Thank you so much, Marie. And Richard Skolnick, please introduce yourself as well. Thank you. My name is uh, Richard Skolnick. I'm a lecturer at Yale where I teach global health courses in the undergraduate college, the School of Public Health, and the School of Management. Uh, I'm an international development person who's worked 40 years on health and education, largely in West Africa and South Asia. However, in the last half of my career, I've worked exclusively on global health. I spent 25 years at the World Bank, retiring as the Director for Health and Education for the South Asia region. I then helped the George Washington University to start a global health program, helped Harvard manage an AIDS treatment program for three countries in Africa, and was the Vice President for International Programs at PRB. And in my post-not-real-retirement uh, life, I got to be involved in a number of advisory committees and working groups for the World Health Organization, served on the technical review panel of the Global Fund, and led a number of um, evaluations of global health programs. I'm going to make comments on three of the most important lessons of life I've learned from international work, because I think there are some questions about international experiences that I will have an opportunity to address in a minute. Uh, so I would, I would say first, while retaining deep humility about what you don't know, you should become as knowledgeable as possible about development, about the countries on which you work, and about key evidence on your main topic areas. Second, uh, you should brutally, and I mean really brutally, in a night, <laughs> focus your efforts on the achievement of outcomes. Don't confuse means with ends. The end you are after is better health at the least possible cost. And the search for that end and efforts to achieve that end should really drive everything else that, uh, that one does. And third, I would suggest that one should put one's heart and soul into what will hopefully be very independent monitoring and evaluation of the efforts in which we're engaged. One can't enable outcomes to be met without knowing at all times where we are on the path to achieving them. And usually we're really not objective enough in evaluating our own outcomes and everyone will learn much more if they're evaluated independently. Uh, and I thank everyone, Jennifer, also very much for the opportunity to join you today. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Richard, and thank you to all of our panelists. We will now proceed with our question and answer session, and looking forward to hearing wealth expertise from all of our panelists. As mentioned, we received questions in advance from you, our audience members, but if you have additional questions, please post them in the text box on the left of your webinar screen. And we will begin with our first question for Brian. What factors do you use to determine if a program is ethical? What criteria should one use to assess the quality of international opportunities? Yeah, so it's a great question, Jennifer. Let me um, let me just say uh, absolutely on the outcomes piece uh, uh, and affirm the comments about uh, rigorous outcomes, uh, also uh, logic models uh, in achieving them. Uh, always a struggle. But but in terms of the ethical qualities of an organization, I would say first, uh, number one, that the, the organization have a clear or the program have a clear statement and guidance on do no harm. Uh, right, the, do, the, the principles of do no harm are, are front and center, uh, including accountability, uh, accountability policy and accountability uh, written into the organization's mandate, its charter, et cetera. Uh, I would say strong and obvious, number two, probably strong and obvious emphasis on the agency of the participants of the program, right? Not just the, not just the, the participants who are serving, but the participants who are being served. Uh, right, I'm, I'm always extremely concerned with the sort of self-actualization and empowerment of 
uh, particularly vulnerable populations, but those in, uh, in countries being served. Uh, three, very similar, uh, equity and participation, right? Uh, the road of good intentions is paved with uh, lots of examples of, of organizations and programs where participation really has been quite one-sided and reciprocity has suffered. Uh, number four, I, I would say avoidance, uh, and again, evidence of avoidance of conflict of interest uh, with different groups uh, and individuals. Uh, number five, is clear and obvious evidence of the public interest of that organization being served. And yes, that's kind of tricky. Uh, what is the public interest? Uh, your question you know, obviously <laughs> makes the audience think it, it differs greatly from, from context to context. And finally, I would say uh, uh, that, that there's evidence that the organization you're planning on working with has respect for local knowledge and expertise. Again, when the experts like the people on the call come in, I think everybody that's a part of Unite for Sight, this is probably number one. Uh, respecting local knowledge and expertise so much is to be gained from doing so. Uh, and then finally, I would say um, that there are intentional organizational mechanisms uh, for understanding the role that that organization is going to play uh, in people's lives and the role of the participants in those <laughs> programs, right? Uh, a, a lot of self-reflection and intentional self-reflection on, on what, the, what the ideal role is for people who are working with that organization. The list goes on, but I think those are, those are my really big ones. Excellent, Brian. Thank you. And Ned, what can be done to eliminate organizations and programs which don't operate with respect for local communities and countries? Sorry, was that for, for me, for Ned? Yes, you, Ned, yes. What can be done to eliminate organizations and programs which don't operate with respect for local communities and countries? So I think, you know, it goes back to really the last two comments. I mean, I think um, in my experience it's been around uh, kind of rigorous monitoring and evaluation of the work that's been done with clarity on outcomes. I think the challenge with that is that most of that work is pretty kind of private and confidential. I think we've got a long way to go to more um, kind of real open databases and, and the ability of people to evaluate the work, whether it's, you know, loans made by the World Bank or investments made by a small nonprofit, local or international. I think there's a real, I think there's just a real challenge out there right now to determine what is good work. Um, and to kind of navigate the uh, kind of testimonial and PR-focused uh, kind of drive of many organizations and, and for investors and donors to kind of more thoughtfully think about which ones are actually having impact, which ones aren't. Uh, and then I think, I, I, I think once that starts to happen, I think you'll see a weeding out of bad organizations over time. Um, I do think there's also a lot of questions around uh, kind of funding flows and the roles and responsibilities of different actors. And so, you know, down the road, um, a lot of the reason we have it in philanthropy is because of market failure and government failure. And so bigger questions aren't just did you have an impact in this particular village or did you have an impact with this change, but did you actually rewire systems over time to better serve people uh, in fundamentally new ways. I think there's a lot of tools that have emerged that allow for kind of constituent or community voices to emerge. They're not perfect, but they're going in the right direction. And I think once we're able to kind of clean that up and get a sense of what's real and what's noise and look at that in fundamentally different ways, then I think we're going to be in a much better uh, position than we are today, and certainly we were, we were 10 years ago, to really kind of start asking hard questions about who is effective at, at kind of transforming lives and systems and who um, just talks about it in an interesting way. Great. Thank you, Ned. And another question for you, Ned. How can organizations best identify students and professionals who will be engaged ethically in their programs abroad? Well, I don't think that's particularly easy, and I think what Brian is talking about is absolutely right. I think um, 
you know, it's interesting. It's, I, I, I first went overseas in a very different time. Uh, I went over in the 1980s, um, and I did that through a professor at my university who saw something in me and threw me into kind of the deserts of northern Kenya. And, and I ended up on a really interesting water project where the guy who ran it, um, he and his team, uh, all Kenyan, um, you know, basically said to me, you know, you, you're from Buffalo, New York. You know, you've probably have never seen a camel. You certainly don't understand deserts. You need to, like, shut up and listen for a couple of years and, uh, and use it as a great learning opportunity. And so I went in in a very different way than students tend to go in now. Um, and I went in at a time where I think my experience was a little more common than the experience right now of people doing things. And I think that, that changed the dynamic a lot because a lot of the people who went in like I did, um, you know, in their early 20s, uh, really did go in with that humility and, and were going for a whole range of reasons that we can talk about. But at the end of the day, um, there was there was this opportunity. It was almost like, you know, old school internships or it's almost like, a, you know, like you learn to trade, um, and and that's gone a little bit. And I think there's positive reasons why that's gone, but I think there's some negative reasons why that's gone. I think that's a little bit what Brian was getting at. Um, so I think organizations actually have a very hard time navigating, like who's a good candidate and who's not a good candidate. And I also think the flow uh, is is so variable um, that it's it's almost hard to track it. If that makes sense. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ned. And Scott, what are specific ways that students and professionals can prepare themselves for the humility necessary for international experiences? I would say on that, the first thing is to be very honest with yourself about what your real purpose of the trip is. Is it really trying to help the target country or the target people, or are you really looking at your own education and experience? And uh, you need to take a really hard look at that. And if you're not comfortable with the answer, maybe you need to take a step back and reconsider. Um, I think it partially goes back to what Brian was saying uh, a couple of minutes ago, uh, the way I used to phrase uh, his comment about making sure you have the skill set to do what you plan to do. Uh, I remember saying to my own children that it's great to want to save the world, but you do need the skill set to do it. And it is well worthwhile to look at yourself and perhaps spend a little time and effort developing the skill set that's necessary. Uh, specifically in terms of trying to be prepared for exactly what you, the mindset you need to have in an, for an international experience, Frankly, there is no substitute for learning as much as possible about the destination. What is the, uh, what is the local knowledge and expertise? What is the local culture? Uh, and that means not just in your own field, but the place itself. What, what is its history? What is its history in the field you're working in? Uh, if you're working in a medical field, like I always was, uh, what, is it, what is its medical history? What, used to happen in this place and what is happening now and why have you been invited in the first place? Uh, secondly, of course, there is no substitute for, for experience. It's always helpful to have had the opportunity to see and understand how things work and it's always helpful to have made every mistake in the book and to do and have said every stupid thing you can ever say and do uh, so that maybe the next time you don't do it. You know, it's sort of like life in that regard. Uh, but there does have to be the first few times you do places, the first few times you have experiences. And for that, I think knowledge and knowledge of the destination really is your best possible preparation. Wonderful. Thank you, Scott. And Marie, why is pre-departure training essential to an international experience, and what should one do if they will be pursuing a program which doesn't offer or require pre-departure training? 
Thanks for this question, Jennifer. I think it's so important because we do know that young people in particular are leaving their home countries to study and volunteer and work abroad at a truly unprecedented rate. So what I can say is, and I'm, this is reflective of, of the other <laughs> colleagues on the call, is that preparation is essential. Um, and the goal being that we want to truly be assets to a community and not burdens. And part of that is self-reflection, as many people have mentioned, um, what are your own goals, what are your skills, how can you contribute in a meaningful way. Um, and so that is all part and parcel of pre-departure orientation. I personally believe that it's the responsibility of the sending institution to provide a robust pre-departure orientation. Unite for Sight does a fabulous job of this and, um, and many academic institutions do as well. Um, but students also have a responsibility to research their host country and organization, much like my colleagues on the call have mentioned. What are the political, social, economic, and historical nuances of the host country? Are there language considerations or particular training that's needed? It really is a two-way street. So some of my recommendations for pre-departure training include the following, and this would be both um, through the lens of an administrator or faculty in an institution or an organization that since an individual, but also someone who is searching out pre-departure training on their own. There are, the internet can be an incredibly valuable resource in this domain. So utilize online training modules and webinars. Here at Vanderbilt, we've created our own training modules by utilizing particular resources at our institution, international experts, students, those who've worked with organizations like Doctors Without Borders, Partners in Health, and so on. But you really don't have to recreate the wheel. There are plenty of existing online training modules, resources that are very effective. Uh, case in point is Unite for Sites Cultural Competency online modules and other pre-departure training. Um, I would also recommend reviewing case studies and literature on preparation for international experiences. So just like modules, there are great studies that are available online. Um, I've asked students to develop case studies based on their own experiences that we used in class discussions and have found that to be a really robust um, source of information to draw from. Blogs in another <coughs> very interesting and some programs require written reflection and that can be a great source of, of training and just preparation for the site you're going. And then I would say that for faculty and administrators at academic institutions who are involved in pre-departure training, so obviously you can use students and you can also use foreign experts. You know, even those who live in your communities, who are well-versed in the country, um, maybe that's their country of origin, um, bringing them in for panel discussions as experts in that, in that area, thinking about um, additional ways that you can help students to imagine navigating a culture in the U.S. Um, or abroad uh, in kind of foreign context and, and the skills and toolkits that they would need to be effective. Great. Thank you so much, Marie. And Richard, oftentimes those interested in going abroad focus only on their own plans to help make an impact. However, there's much for them to learn from the local professionals. What should be one's focus while abroad? Uh, Jennifer, thank you. I'm, I'm going to answer the question, but with a tiny twist, if I might, to help address some of the interesting discussions that have taken place. Um, I was very fortunate in having never left home as a 16-year-old. My first airplane ride was to the Philippines as an AFS high school exchange student. And then I was lucky enough to go from Dayton, Ohio to Yale, which I entered in 1967. And they had an experimental five-year program. And between my second and third year, I spent a year back at the Philippines living with my host family from my AFS experience and spent a year uh, teaching. And uh, prior to that, of course, I'd had, I, I never left Ohio, Indiana, or Illinois. 
and I only visited Indiana because you couldn't get there if you moved from Chicago to Dayton without, without going through Indiana. And I'm a big believer in um, early exposure to international settings for students who have an interest and no skills at all because I think it's really fundamental for them at an early stage as long as there's clarity with the host institution and it, it really needs to be um, need, need to be uh, students need opportunities at a very early stage to uh, get a feel for what these countries what what different countries are like what different sectors are like what different cultures are like and what different um, languages are like and only then I think do they have a foundation for deciding whether or not this is something that um, they ought to pursue so to more directly answer your question I would say what's really fundamental at the start is don't worry about saving the world and don't worry about having an impact and at this stage don't even worry about skills I'm talking the very early stage worry really only about one thing and that is learning as much as you possibly can uh, the people hosting you will know you're young they'll know you have no skills and yet they've decided to open up their organization to you uh, I think what's really fundamental at the early stage is not how you can help to transform others but how you can be transformed in a way that will set a foundation for your eventually uh, pursuing this work if you wish and then if you would um, I'd say stay as long as you can. Don't go for four weeks. Stay the whole summer or stay for two years if you can stay for longer. Work with an organization that has a track record of success and of learning. Um, try to see if there are some specific tasks that you can call your own or partly your own uh, that you can use as a platform for learning as much as possible. Work with local people and surround yourself as much as you can and latch on as much as you can to people who know much more than you do, which is something you must do throughout your life if you want to learn. And then um, prepare, 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 as everyone says before you go. Last thing I'd say is I'm always deeply offended when students come to me and say, oh, Professor Skolnick, you've been in India 91 times. I'm thrilled to tell you tomorrow I'm going to India for a month. And I deeply regret they didn't come to see me three months before because I would have given them my 10 books on India you must read before you step one foot in the country and my list of 10 movies that you must also see before you step foot in the country. And I think it's really important to have, as our friends at Vanderbilt said, different kinds of learning opportunities to help students ensure that they're really prepared to learn and to build on the skills they have as they become more mature professionals. I'm sorry for the lengthy answer, but I hope you'll forgive me. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Richard. <laughs> and the question for you guys, while abroad, how should one keep oneself grounded in humility and respect for the local community? What are specific steps and strategies? Ned? Sorry, I was on mute as well. Um, okay. I think one of the, yeah, no, I think one of the best things Again, one of the best things that I did, even though there were times that it was absolutely awful, was I really dedicated a lot of time to learn local languages. Um, and, and again, I, I surrounded myself with people, and I thought the last answer was really very good. You know, I, I think I was really clear, you know, how this was, um, how this early stage experience was helping me and didn't make any assumptions beyond that. Um, and I, I really was fortunate and continued to surround myself with a wide array of people who would be open to, to feeding back um, and helping me do my job better and all that. But, but simple things like learning the local language actually do a lot. Great. Thank you, Ned. And Richard, what are useful tips to maximize the experiences of students going abroad for internships? Well, I, I, um, I'm just going to elaborate a little bit, Jennifer, if I might, on what I said before. Um, I mean, one is um, get the word out, I think, and learn as much as you can from peers and from others who have participated in those experiences to help you both select what is the most appropriate experience uh, and to learn as much as you can. Uh, two is... Um, there, in, in general, I think the, the longer one can go, the better, provided that the work program is consistent with that duration. 
Uh, I'm on the board of Yale China, and in a recent discussion we had, for example, there were lots of there was lots of discussion about what to do with the teaching fellows program, for example. But the one focus that no one wanted to alter was the idea that two years is really the minim minimum, and the, and probably the max too, for a post graduation learning experience, because it takes three months to get going and three months to wind down. And if you do that, you can have a solid 18-month experience. I think if you're going away for the summer, uh, I always regret when students go away for four weeks or six weeks. I would go say uh, farewell to your goodbye to your parents, uh, get on a plane, go away for every moment you can, because as I tell students, don't do during the term, uh, don't during the summer what you can do during the term. Don't work in a lab in the summer because you want to go to med school when you could wind up working at the International Center for Diarrheal Disease Research in Bangladesh. You can't work in Bangladesh during the term. So use your summer to profit as much as you can from experiences you are just not going to get at school. Um, I think uh, another, as I mentioned before, but I'll elaborate on is uh, there are so many students, as our friend from Vanderbilt said, now wanting to go away. But I think it's important to find an organization with which to work that has experience, that has really solid and outstanding talent, that enjoys working with students, and students who don't know anything and for whom this is the first experience, and organizations that enjoy mentoring and take pride in mentoring. And we'll see your success, Jennifer, later as a reflection of the good work they did when you were just a young, naive American kid coming to learn all about how Uganda works. Um, and I think, um, again, I think it's the last thing I'd say is uh, uh, prepare, 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 as each of the uh, panelists has said in turn. Learn as much as you can about the country. Learn as much as you can about the culture learn as much as you can about the language, learn as much as you can about how the place works, learn how to show respect and show humility uh, because uh, these are all signs that will make you more endeared. A, a, you should do this because you want to, but in addition, and when you learn to do this, you will be much better received, much better appreciated, and learn much more in turn. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Richard. And Shin, what is your recommendation about technology use, <coughs> blogging, and social media while in country, especially with regards to having the most meaningful experience abroad? Uh, thanks a lot, Jennifer. Um, this question was definitely a hard one for me. I think when I first started in global health, uh, Twitter, Facebook was sort of in its infancy as really has <laughs> blown up now. Um, I think for even how the question is phrased and through a lot of conversation to our colleagues, um, there seems to be somewhat of a, an egocentric focus on how much of the experience or well, how many pictures or blogs about uh, one person's experience abroad uh, can be shared. And for me, uh, I'd like to sort of flip it a little bit. Um, for a lot of work that we've done at Partners in Health, whenever we do a lot of our social media campaigning, any blogs or if we're ever sort of showcasing any of our work, the focus is always on the work and the work is always, the, the showcase is always on our patients, on our outcomes, or you know, more particularly on a lot of our local colleagues who sort of have the courage and energy to be able to do a lot of this work on a daily basis. A lot of, for a lot of people coming in uh, who might be new, who may not know the organization they're going into just yet, I always find that uh, more information, less on, you know, my name is Jen, I have this really great experience, look at everything I'm doing, is probably not as valuable for the larger picture of global health and social equity as it would be to say, uh, I'm here in Lesotho, the HIV rate is above 25%, have really failed, have really huge issues with MDR-TV. Here's this really incredible project that's being done by this local organization and really start to go through what global health should look like and what some solutions should look like and what you're learning. Um, I, I feel like so much of the social media that you see now uh, very satirically are, are on things like uh, humanitarians of Tinder where you have people taking pictures of them abroad uh, to date other people for very short periods of time and those things always infuriate me to no end. Um, but a lot of, there is a lot of good that can be used to harness all that attention, all that energy 
of people that may not have the opportunity to go abroad or may not have the opportunity to really talk about uh, really significant issues like MDR-TB in West Africa and to help other people not only learn uh, but maybe to spur action. Uh, GoFundMe's and other you know, small funding campaigns are always used um, for private ventures here in the U.S., but very rarely are they used for more social initiatives. Um, you know, making the most out of your time and making use of all that energy while you're there to really focus in on, you know, what does my organization need? What sort of ideas um, am I hearing but they're not having the funding for? Or how can I, you know, better help the types of strategies and solutions that maybe we don't have the resources to do uh, through tapping into other markets that, you know, as of right then and right now, they wouldn't necessarily have access to. Um, on the other end of sort of just general technology use, there's uh, a lot of use that uh, we and Partners in Health have used around mobile technology, and this really links more to um, academia, um, sort of alluding to another question previously. There tends to be a lot of a gap between what you learn in the classroom and then what you end up uh, finding out in reality and in real life. And oftentimes what we had did at Partners in Health with places like the Harvard School of Public Health and the Boston University School of, School of Public Health is that we ended up creating partnerships where we identified very key uh, objectives and outcomes that we needed uh, very specific expertise that we didn't have at any of our sites. Um, one specific example was that we uh, partnered with Boston University School of Public Health with a mobile health technology class uh, where a group of seven students uh, worked with us to create a mobile device uh, to help with our depression screening in uh, rural parts of Haiti to be able to collect data to see how we were doing it also to better be able to track patients. And that worked out extremely well. And I use that example to say, I wish I would see more of those sorts of partnerships where students would sort of take the initiative to realize of the amazing resources that they have while in the United States, while at large institutions, uh, to be able to say to their academic institutions, you know, I really want to be able to bridge the disconnect between what I learn in the classroom and what actually happens in the field. And given there seems to be a win-win situation right here, how about we be able to connect those two things and have the most impact possible? Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Shin. And a question for both Shin and Brian. Maybe Shin, if you'd like to go to share what, uh, your thoughts first. How can educators support the balance between humility and observation versus offering skills and capabilities? That's a really hard question. Um, you know, I, I think, again, it goes back to my original point of, you know, we talk about healthcare a lot. We talk a lot about economic development a lot. Um, I think within the, the global health field, I, I agree with previous comments about I often get scared that it's become such a popular field and people sort of do it for the sake of doing it and to say that they did it. Um, you know, Martin Luther King's birthday was uh, just yesterday and there's always reminders of social justice and what that means and social equity and whether that's here in the United States or abroad, it's always important to understand Yes, the cultural contexts are really important, the medical contexts are really important, the social contexts are really important, but just the overarching history of all of these countries that we end up working in um, is significantly important to truly understand uh, why people's health outcomes are what they are, to understand why people's economic outcomes are what they are. And when you sort of more fully understand that when you're going there, you're not just going there to do health education or you're not just going there uh, you know, to, to help build a well or not just going there to, to learn more, but you're actually part of this larger social movement of understanding the historical context of poverty and of racism and, and structural violence and to understand that you are now taking part of this larger movement to be able to sort of turn back a lot of those issues. I, I think, at least for me, uh, when I really started this work, that really helped me put a lot of um, the complexity, again, uh, within the framework of understanding why I, I really truly need to listen and learn, but also understand that this isn't a very simple one-time fix, that there's so much more to be done, and to understand people's circumstances, but also to understand their history, I think for me was really a key in helping me sort of hone in on my humility. Yeah, and Jennifer, I think it's a, I think it's a fantastic, yeah, Jennifer, can you hear me? Yeah, I, go ahead, I, think, I, think, I think it's a fantastic question. Uh, it's exactly what we should be asking. Uh, but the short answer is I, I think any program that's developed ought to have two components, right? It, 
on, on the one column is skills and competencies, the capabilities that you're trying to develop in your students uh, or in your participants. Uh, the other side should be emotional uh, intelligence uh, and other kinds of outcomes associated with uh, cognition, attitudes, et cetera. And, and in that column, I would put emotional intelligence uh, as first. And I've talked about this before uh, with you and others at Unite for Sight. Uh, this notion that while you're developing skills, you should be very intentional about building self-awareness, right, which includes emotional self-awareness, accurate self-assessment, and, and conscientiousness. Self-management, which includes self-confidence, adaptability, achievement orientation, uh, and self-control. Three would be social awareness, which includes empathy and kind of an organizational awareness. And fourth, uh, what I call relationship management, which includes a service orientation, uh, developing others or seeking to develop others, strong communication, communication particularly cross-cultural and intercultural communication, uh, building of bonds with people in other countries, the collaboration, trustworthiness, leadership, uh, and team capability. And I think if you spell those out in the beginning of the program and you link them with the capabilities uh, that you're seeking to develop in your participants, and then you, then you ask, then you ask the, uh, the participants to, to link them both in their reflections uh, and in their daily, we keep, we keep account of how those things are, are, are coming to fruition. I think it's, I think it's absolutely achievable. You'll, uh, you'll see humility blossom along with capabilities. Excellent. Thank you so much, Brian and Shin. And uh, our next question for Scott. While working abroad, one may have peers or colleagues who do not demonstrate cultural humility. How should one navigate this type of issue? And that is a really thorny issue, and I like the way that question is worded with the word navigation in there. Uh, I think the whole issue here boils down to anyone showing that lack of humility as a general rule hasn't really done everything we've talked about in this conference the last hour. Uh, what they're exposing is a lack of educational preparation, perhaps a lack of social and emotional awareness and immaturity, uh, and a lack of simply being prepared to think on the spot and act and react in situations in which they may uh, be somewhat uncomfortable. So as far as having to deal with that among one's peer, uh, obviously when dealing with one's peer, that uh, is always an awkward situation and assessing personalities both on the side of the peer as well as the locals with whom you're working is probably key. Uh, frankly, some people don't do real well with any sort of um, confrontation or with any sort of correction, and they may be the ones, as Richard was saying a while ago, that aren't really cut out to be doing this, and it's nice to get those early experiences so people can assess themselves, and see whether they are cut out to be working in the international uh, realm. Uh, but when faced with this situation, it may require direct confrontation with one's own peer. And sometimes the problem may be a simple one that is easy, easily corrected with education. Again, it goes back to being prepared for the entire experience. Uh, other times, though, it may be an underlying lack of ability to understand the platform in which international work is done. That is, someone really just may not get it. And that's a much tougher issue that requires a much more fundamental discussion. And that doesn't necessarily mean that a person on one of their early experiences may make some horrible errors and not, and, and not be salvageable. And that's not true at all. People are generally fully capable of learning and maturing. But that does have to occur. Uh, so, the overarching remedy, I think, goes back to one's own education and preparation. Uh, being able to know and understand the issues makes them easier to recognize, easier to explain, and frankly gives you the credibility necessary to correct any actions that seem to be off base or inappropriate. Terrific. Thank you so much, Scott. And Marie, after returning from an international experience, what should be one's reflection process? 
Thanks for this question. I'm really enjoying hearing um, all of my colleagues' answers to these important questions. So I might take a moment to zoom out to the 30,000 foot level to think about this um, and to think about the purpose academically of an international experience. And so if you imagine it as a form of experiential learning, um, you really, I think, are, are well, well suited to consider John Dewey's famous quote, which is, we don't learn from experience, we learn from reflecting on experience. And so, as an educator at heart, uh, that quote resonates with me, and I think about it often in the context of international education um, and inner experiential learning. And so, you know, it, 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 there's a consensus that's emerging among scholars and practitioners in the field that absent reflection experiences is, you know, in some ways undermined and certainly true learning or that opportunity for true learning um, is potentially lost. And so it's increasingly viewed as an essential component um, of experiential learning and in this case uh, in the international context. And that includes before, during, and after. I wouldn't isolate it just the, the period following the experience, but this intentional and iterative process of planning, doing, reflecting, planning, doing, reflecting. And certainly reflection is time consuming at best, tedious and cumbersome at worst, and it sometimes gets a rap, bad rap, it's too touchy-feely. But it's an important piece and one for us in the field to model to our students and trainees as well. Um, and it can, the way reflection happens is really unique to the individual and the context. You know, in the best case scenario, there's guided reflection that the sending institution provides mentorship during the time that they're on site, uh, and then debrief sessions when they return. We really try to model that with all of our different kinds of academic engagement abroad. Other ways, obviously journaling, blogging, but I'll um, reference some of the things that Shin was saying in particular about how you can use blogging in an effective way or in a way. And Way. And so sometimes even just thinking about kind of a protected forum, maybe amongst other students on your same program where you can reflect in a protected space that's really just about brainstorming and, and unpacking experiences. Um, and certainly thinking about seeking out other peers and mentors who've had international experiences either in the same setting or elsewhere. Um, obviously being aware that reverse culture shock is real. It can undermine experiences and relationships and obviously the process of reflecting can meet that head on um, and once again turn what is in so many cases a rich and meaningful experience into something that is truly a learning experience that you can capitalize on um, and build particular skill sets and apply in other contexts in the future. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Marie. And Brian, what metrics should be used to determine one to determine one's growth from an international experience? Well, uh, I, I would say this, uh, not, not just one, right? Uh, there, are, there are so many. A few years ago, the School for International Training, uh, part of World Learning, uh, asked me the same question, and we created a compendium of more than 82 different assessments uh, that had been done. And so I think, honestly, it's a terrific question. I actually want to direct your audience to some resources rather than answer, because I think it really is program dependent. One, uh, I would take a look at the CAS standards, the CAS standards, right, uh, particularly on learning outcomes. Uh, the CAS standards are critical. I use them in almost everything that I can. This is the Council for the Advancement of Standards Learning and Development Outcomes. You can Google them. They've adapted their learning outcomes and developmental outcomes from uh, their learning outcomes reconsidered. Um, and I, would, and I would focus in on four uh, parts of that. One would be knowledge acquisition. What are the specific skills you want your, uh, your students or participants to, to gain? Two, the cognitive complexity that you want them to achieve. And critically important for international work, the intrapersonal development components. 
and the interpersonal competence components, right? I would overlay all of that uh, with uh, a, a particular sensibility, which is increasingly it is, and if you look at the CAT standards, you'll find plenty of them that you can pull as general guides and then marry those to the specific outcomes you're seeking in the programs. But the overlay that I would put on that uh, is, is one that says increasingly it is vitally important to determine outcomes that are both self-reported and non-self-reported. So Marie's idea about journaling, and I would take it one step further and say some kind of portfolio, uh, increasingly for accreditors but also professors, Portfolios are a terrific way of getting non-self-reported data. Also, experience, uh, experiences in the field that are measured by supervisors, right? Uh, so there's been this tendency to just simply survey and survey and survey. And while I think there are great utilities in surveys, what we really need to do to measure these, these competencies, to measure uh, uh, skill development and cognitive development over time is, is a combination of self-reported, non-self-reported data. Um, uh, I, I could go on for an hour and a half. I, I, I teach a couple of classes on this. So uh, I'll leave it at that. And uh, maybe maybe we need to develop a module on this for uh, Unite Your Psych. Excellent. Thank you so much, Brian. And thank you to all of our phenomenal panelists for all of the expertise that you have shared with our audience today. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you so much.